Welcome to Five Books for Catholics, where an expert selects and explains five outstanding books in some aspect of Catholic life, doctrine, or culture. Genesis, or Bereshis, in the beginning, is the first book of the Bible. It tells the story of creation and God's covenants with the first men in chapters 1 to 11. In chapters 12 to 50, it tells the story of God's covenants with the patriarchs. It ends with the death of Joseph, who had brought to Egypt both his brothers and his father Jacob. Many of the stories related in Genesis are amongst the most memorable ones in the Bible. They also constitute many of the most fundamental episodes in salvation history. St. Jerome's dictum, that knowing Scripture is essential for knowing Christ is particularly applicable to Genesis. Understanding Genesis is indispensable for understanding who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. In this interview, Steve Ray discusses some of the books that can help us understand Genesis. Steve Ray is a Catholic speaker, author and convert to Catholicism who shares his conversion story and his insights in various topics, such as apologetics, the Bible, evangelism, family, and more. With his wife Janet, he regularly guides pilgrimages to the Holy Land. He is the host of the popular film series, The Footprints of God, and the author of the best-selling books, Crossing the Tiber and St. John's Gospel. Among his recent publications is Genesis, a Bible study guide and introduction. Steve Ray, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Glad to join you. We'll dive right in and talk about Genesis in general. Who wrote Genesis? (laughs) Well, there's a big debate about that. But if we go with Jesus's opinion, Uh, we would say that Moses wrote it. Actually, from the beginning of time and the story of the whole Bible, it's been um, viewed that Jesus, uh, that uh, Moses was the author of it. And and when you're looking at this, you can't just say Genesis, but there's five books together called the Law of Moses or the Pentateuch. Penta means five and tuch means scrolls, five scrolls. And they've always been viewed as the work of Moses, the prophet and the lawgiver. So from the very, all through the Old Testament, through the Gospels, through the New Testament, it was never even discussed who wrote it. It was just Moses wrote those. But in the last hundred years or so, there's a new, a whole new movement of people that think they have discovered that Moses wasn't the author, that it was really written around four or 500 B.C., by various authors and then redacted or kind of knit all together into the story that we have now. And they divide it up into those who use this name of God wrote this part and those who use Yahweh or Elohim wrote this part and the priests wrote this part. You know, it really gets confusing and it really distracting in a way. And I think it's, it causes skepticism in people. And, and um, I really don't think there's any good reason to decide that Moses didn't write it. And there's a lot of scholars now like Scott Hahn and others who are coming back to the mosaic authorship. So in the book, in my book, I go through those various views, uh, not too pedantically, because you don't want to bog down in it. But I came to the conclusion in, in the book that it's mosaic authorship, although it may have been redacted in time. For example, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses talks about his death. And so likely he didn't write that part, that that may have been redacted and added by a a future author. But in general, I'd say that the authorship of Genesis is mosaic, although it may have been edited or put together uh, by some later editors. And what is the central theme of Genesis? Wow, the central theme. (laughs) You might have to put an S on the end of that and make it plural. Um, the general theme of it is, and I consider it probably the most important book of the Bible, simply because it, it is um, it lays the foundation for everything else. 
every other book of the Bible, all 72 books following, are all dependent on Genesis. It's the foundation. It tells where we came from, what was before the beginning, why is there problems in the world today, what came about that brought the abnormality or the bentness, as C.S. Lewis says, the bentness to the universe today. And um, it tells us where we're going and the purpose of why we're here and that there is a creator or an artist, a, a, a poet even. Because in the book of Romans, it says that we can see a lot about the about God through looking at what he has made. And those words, what he has made is the word poema in Greek. So it's kind of like he's a poet. He's made something. We can learn about him through that. So the book of Genesis the main theme, I think, is to lay the foundation for everything, to open, pull back the curtain and tell us things that we could never know with our five senses, that we could never know with the science as we use science today. It's a revelation from God to explain actually what was for the, from before the beginning, why he created us, basically how it was done, why there's problems, where we're going. And it lays the foundation for all the rest of scripture and everything we are as Catholics. That is the main theme. But I would also say that there are some sub themes too. And you see right away that God's plan seemed to have been thwarted by the serpent. So one of the themes then is that God is able to turn evil into good. He is able to fulfill his purposes and plans, even when there's opposition and that he has can draw straight with crooked lines, so to speak. He can use sinful men and sinful actions to bring about his purposes, even though from a human point of view, we would think that everything's been screwed up. The serpent came in, they got kicked out of the garden. Oh, everything is screwed up. God's plan has been thwarted, but God ended up actually turning that to something better for us. Like it says in the Easter Vigil Mass, oh, happy fault of Adam, which brought us such a great redeemer. So that even through the problems and the seemingly disastrous effects, God can take those and still use them for his benefit. So that is also a theme. And another sub-theme would be that God winnows people out. He, he takes two and from those he chooses one. Esau and Jacob, he, even though Esau was the firstborn, he chooses Jacob and he carries the line through his sovereign choices to bring about a people, the land of Israel and the Jewish people, so that when his redeemer, when his plan is being fulfilled with Jesus Christ, there's a people who will recognize him or should have recognized him and are prepared for him. So First of all, it gives a foundation for everything. Second of all, it shows that he takes even things that are wrong and uses them for his good. And I think a third subplot is that he winnows people out and there's always a remnant, no matter how sinful people get. He always preserves a remnant and he winnows people out and he keeps that line going so that he fulfills his plan to bring about Jesus Christ, the, the solution to it all. What's the general structure of Genesis? We've talked about the themes, but what's the general structure? The, uh, the general structure is very simple, actually, and, and it's a way that people can kind of put it in their shirt pocket. You know, it's very simple. If you memorize the simple outline, you have the whole book of Genesis in a nutshell. So the way I see it is that Genesis is divided into two parts, chapters 1 through 11 and chapters 12 through 50. There are 50 chapters total. And my book, by the way, has 50 chapters so that you can easily follow the chapters of Genesis. So if you divide it into two parts, so the first part is chapters 1 through 11. It's what we could call prehistory or before actual dates are assigned to things. For example, you can't say that God created the world in 6000 BC on April 4th at 12 o'clock. So it, it, we don't know the date when creation took place. We don't know the date when the fall took place. But we know that these are historical events. They just don't have the dates that we can assign to them. So though that section, you can divide into four parts, creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. So you have those four. That's easy to remember. Flood, that creation, fall, flood, and Babel. 
The second half then is also divided into four parts. And it begins with Abraham because there we begin with archaeology and other cultures that are simultaneously with the uh, Ur of the Chaldeans and so on. So you have that is called the historic period where we can really assign dates. So that section from chapter 12 to 50 is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So the whole thing is, if you remember these eight, you got the whole book of Genesis in a nutshell. You've got creation, fall, flood, and the Tower of Babel, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And there you've got the whole book in a simple little outline. That's pretty straightforward. And with your yeah. wife, you regularly lead pilgrimages to the Holy Land. Has visiting the sites of the biblical events changed your understanding and appreciation of Genesis? Oh, it sure does. I, see, I was raised as a Baptist. My parents were Baptist converts in 1953 because of Billy Graham. And so my dad just fell in love with the Bible in 1953. I was born in 1954 as an answer to their prayers to have kids that they could raise for Jesus now. So you can imagine that I was immersed in the Bible when I was a kid and in Bible classes and so on. And I always have loved the Bible. It's a gift that my parents gave me. And in the in the edit, um, credits of the book, Genesis, I, I credit my mom and dad for that and thank them for the love of scripture that they instilled in me. So yes, I, but when I became Catholic, I had this insatiable desire to visit the places that were mentioned in the Bible because I wanted to... I always believed it was true, but I wanted to, in a way, live it, live the Bible in the Holy Land. So we've been to Israel over 200 times, my wife and I, leading pilgrimages, making documentary movies, doing research, taking our kids on pilgrimage. And by the way, taking your kids there is the smartest thing you can do. Um, it has a, it, just an indelible mark on their souls. And so I can say that I think that we have visited every place that Genesis mentions in the Bible, even Iraq, where Ur is, Abraham started in Iraq. The flood was in Iraq. The uh, ark rested on Mount Ararat, which is in Turkey of today. Uh, so all the places, when I did our movie, for example, on Abraham, we did a documentary, um, and 90 minute documentary. And during that, we, we filmed in Iraq and in Turkey and the Palestinian areas and in Israel. And I think we have over the last 29 years of being Catholics, visited all the places that Genesis mentions. And it really does help to understand because the Bible was not written for us. And I know people say, what are you talking about? Not written for, of course it's written for us. Well, it was written though in a time period and in a culture and in a geographical area. And in order to understand the context and the richness of the text, and to understand the richness of the story being relayed to us, you need to be familiar with the context, the historical, geographical, linguistic context, in order to get the most out of it. Because it wasn't written in English. It wasn't written under democracy. It wasn't written um, in the year 2023. It was written, some of it, almost 18, uh, 4,000 years ago. Jesus was 2,000 years ago, but Genesis was written pretty much in the period of around 18, 2,000, 1,800 BC. And in order to really understand the book of Genesis and the beginning of the story, one has to go back to that land and understand how those people lived and what their language was and what laws they had. For, I'll give you an example. Uh, when Sarah wants to have the baby and she's giving up hope because she's so old already in her in her 80s, and she just says to Abraham, go bring Hagar and have a baby with her, and that will be my son. And we say, well, that's pretty outrageous. Nobody would do that today in America. I mean, that's just, but in those days, there was a law that if a woman could not have a child, that she could take her slave or her servant and have her husband have a child through the slave, and then the baby is born on the mistress's knees. And that act of having it born on, the, on her knees is a form of adoption that becomes her child. Now, see, if you understand the laws of the culture around, then that makes sense what they did with Hagar 
in American terms, it seems kind of outrageous, but it would be a normal, a normal activity back uh, 4,000 years ago. So the more we understand the culture, the more we understand the story and the message that God is giving us. So I always say that um, to th this book will be helpful to people because in it, I try to go back and bring out the culture, the land, the language, the meaning of words as they were, the laws that were, were uh, um, in existence back then so that things make sense. I'll give you one more example if I'm not talking too much here. Um, another example would be God saying to take your son and offer him as a Holocaust, a, a human sacrifice. This is outrageous. And yet in Abraham's time, human sacrifice was just a part of everyday life. In Ur, that's spelled U-R, where Abraham came from, it's in near Nazaria in Iraq of today, they had human sacrifice. When the king died, they found, they dug up through archaeologists, these big grave sites called death pits. And when the king died, they would bury him and they would kill everybody that worked for him, this whole retinue of servants and horsemen and generals. And they would all be laid in order around the king and for his burial so that they could travel with him in the afterlife. So human sacrifice was just common back then. And so it's not, it doesn't sound as outrageous in the culture as it does today. And yet, I have to say, we still practice human sacrifice today because I don't know how many million babies are aborted in the United States in a year, but that's human sacrifice if I ever heard of it. What led you to write your own study guide on Genesis? Well, that's, uh, I, I said I've always loved the Bible and I knew how important Genesis was, but I have also a commentary on John. It's kind of a companion volume. Interestingly enough, I think those are the two most important books of the Bible. One, because Genesis lays the whole foundation for everything. And second of all, because um, John then really builds off Genesis. I, I'm convinced that you cannot really understand John unless you understand Genesis first, at least in its riches. And both of them begin with the words, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So I, when I became a Catholic, people knew that I had studied the Bible as a Protestant. And they asked me if I, I would teach Bible studies at our parish. So it started out as simple as that. And I said, okay, I will. So I went to the Catholic bookstore and I thought there would be racks and racks of Bible study material that I would be able to find. And I found there was nothing. If you go to an evangelical bookstore, you're going to find a whole wall of books on different Bible studies, you know, Bible study on Genesis, Bible study on hope, all kinds of Bible studies that you can use. But I went to the Catholic church and I found a lot of rosaries and um, you know, confirmation dresses and things like that. But I didn't find any of the Bible study books that I was hoping to find. So I said, uh oh, I told him I'd do it. I'm gonna have to write my own. So that's how it got started, both with John and Genesis. They both started out as Bible study guides that I was writing for classes. And then as time went on, I thought I'm gonna turn those into books. And Ignatius Press, I'd already written several books with Ignatius Press. And they said, yes, we would like you to do a book on Genesis, on, on John. So I wrote that one first, and it was it was quite well received. And then um, I we worked on Genesis. Genesis took a while. It's been it's been a long many years in the process, but I think that, that helped the end result because I it gave me more time to think through it, to travel to all these places that I had not done before I wrote the study guide, the original Bible study. So I think this is then the mature, much more mature result of having done that. So it all began with being asked to do a Bible study and not having any material. So I had to write it my own. And then I developed it into this. Now, the next one Ignatius Press has asked me to write, and I'm already getting started on, is the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the birth of the church. Very good. What are the key features of your study guide on Genesis? Well, I, I'm not a, I'm not a theologian or a philosopher. So I would start by saying that I'm, I'm more of a popularizer. I, I'm, my dad would not buy me a television when I was a kid. He, he said, we're going to read books. And he gave me an insatiable curiosity. 
as a kid. And so I always wanted to learn. So the, the main things that I think the book is, is it, I'm writing it not as a boring, pedantic, scholarly book that only college professors are going to read. I wrote it, I was hoping it would come out, and I've, I've been told that it is, in a way, it's a, can be read almost as a novel, as a story. People have said, I can't set it down once I start reading it. And someone told me I'm reading it out loud to my wife, and we just can't stop. We just keep reading it because it's an easy read aloud book. So I, I'm wanting to take a book that some people are intimidated by. They see this uh, this book on the on the coffee table and it's covered with dust and they open it and it says Genesis and then they get all these names and Melchizedek and all. Now, maybe I'll just read this next year. I wanted to make Genesis accessible, make it even fun to read, make it because I will say that the, the Moses, the writer of Genesis wrote an exquisite piece of literature, especially when you look at Abraham going up Mount Moriah to offer his son. The language that is used is sparse. It's kind of austere in a way, and yet the words are chosen so carefully. It's it's an elegant piece of writing, and you read it if you read it slowly, and it, it you it draws you into the heartbreak and the emotion of a man walking his son. And twice it says, "And the two of them walked on together." <laughs> this is a and. I wanted to bring all of that out. I wanted people to see that Genesis is really a fabulous piece of literature. It's a wonderful story in a novel. And when you get to the story of Joseph at the end, oh my goodness, I didn't want to quit. And when his brothers come who had sold him into slavery and who had lied to their father with a with his multicolored cloak covered with blood and said, let him draw the conclusion that his son had been killed. When you read that story and then his brothers come to Egypt and they don't realize that the vizier of Egypt is their older brother who they had told their father was dead and how he redeems them. He doesn't be, he's not vindictive. He, there's redemption in Joseph's mind. I would have been vindictive. Joseph wasn't. Joseph was like Christ. He's a picture of Christ presented here. And he very gently and in a way corrects his brothers, makes them regret what they did and repent of it all. This, the whole story is elegant. So I wanted a long answer, but I wanted to show the elegance of the book, the story of the book, and help people enter into that. Now, there are a lot of theological terms and the whole idea of Abraham and his faith and be becoming the source of salvation for all of us. And I wanted to, to talk about some of the important words. Like, when was the word love first used in the Bible? See, that that's a question I've never heard anybody ask before. And the placement of the first time the word love is used and the second time is so strategically located that I think it's, it's going to be fun and interesting for people to discover that. By the way, the first time is Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love. The first time the word love is used of a father for his only begotten son. Does that ring a bell? Bing, bing, bing. Yes. God, the father son. and his son. And then you've got the next one is Isaac who his bride is being brought to him, Rebecca, and it says he loves his bride. Well, what other son of an only begotten son falls in love with a bride? And that's Jesus and his church. So the two times the word love is used is one of a father for his only begotten son. And the second is a son falling in love with the bride, the church. So if you start kind of eliciting, pulling those things out of the text it makes it quite thrilling to read and to study. So those are some of the main things that I did while I was writing the book. I didn't want it to be pedantic and slow. I wanted it to be a very exciting, personal read, which also shows the heart of God. I really think that in the book, I'm, I'm revealing God's heart because he reveals it in Genesis. With the odd exception, the books you've recommended seem to be reference books. They're not meant to yes. be read in a single sitting, but consulted as need be. Is this what you have in mind? Right. Yes. And and I, when you asked me what five books did I use the most, uh, it kind of threw me a little bit for a curveball, I must admit, because these are books I didn't read from cover to cover. I use them as resource material. So say I'm in a passage of Genesis and I want to say, wow, what? how have other people thought about this through history? See, I don't just care about what I think. 
many, a lot of Bible studies today are conducted that way. They're, um, they're, you sit down in a group and you say, well, what, what did you think about this passage? What did this passage mean to you? And it becomes a very personal, subjective kind of a thing. My book, I want it to be more, what did the author want us to understand? So I have a whole selection of books. Actually, I'm going to turn my computer here so you can see them. I mean, I have a whole bunch of books that I brought up here for our conversation together. And a lot of the books that I use that I mentioned to you are actually on a software program I have called Verbum, which I use for, it's a Catholic Bible study and uh, um, history. I've got over 16,000 volumes on that program. So in many ways, I have begun to use just so you know, I have over 20,000 books in my house, but I find myself using the physical books less and the digital books more because you can do searches and things on digital that you can't, although I certainly love the smell of a real book. I love the feel of a real book in my hands, but the digital books become more um, useful in the sense that they're, you can do searches and things. So People have asked me, have you read all those books or are these books on Genesis? And I say, well, I ask them the question is, do you have a spice rack in your kitchen with nutmeg and cayenne pepper and these things? And they say, yes. I said, well, did you eat all of them? And they say, well, no, I use them just a little here and there to spice foods. Well, that's how I use a library. I don't, I view my libraries like a spice rack. I have them all there, all these books on the shelves and in my digital program. And I don't necessarily, now there are some books, of course, that you read. I would suggest a book on Genesis is a good read from cover to cover. But a lot of books that I used for this are more research books. That's like a spice rack where you pull this book off and you use a little here and you use a little there. So I have given you five books. One of the unusual things about my book on Genesis is that I use a lot of Jewish sources. I use a lot of fathers of the church, papal documents, church documents, uh, early fathers of the church especially. I like using those because you, you, what did the early church think about them? A lot of New Testament scholars and things I did. But one of the, I also used evangelical Protestants because a lot of them have insights that are quite good. Um, but I used a lot of Jewish sources and I think most of the, the ones I gave you, at least three of them, were Jewish sources, because I find I like the, the ones that were pre-Christian, um, like, for example, called the Book of Jubilees, which is a rewriting of Genesis and Exodus, um, just before the time of Christ, where it's, it's embellished a lot, and shows what Jesus would have been familiar with when he heard Genesis, he would have had these books. And the first century, Josephus and Philo, they've written all about it. And they mentioned the book of Genesis over and over again, in fact, have a very, like a first century commentary on it. And then in the Middle Ages, these rabbis from the Middle Ages, like Rambon, he's one that I mentioned with you. Um, they, they're kind of embellish things a lot and they weave into it their Jewish traditions. And then the modern ones, um, the first one I mentioned to you is probably my favorite commentary, favorite book of all is uh, the man's name is Nahum Sarna. He's, he's dead now, but he wrote commentaries on scripture, very much Jewish. And it's fun to read, by the way, uh, Dominic, and the, the way they struggle with um, passages that are clearly messianic about Jesus and how they struggle with those because they don't accept him as the Messiah and a Jewish study Bible, which the footnotes are very helpful. So th this is kind of an overview of the books um, that I used and how I use them and why, because I wanted to give people a wide spectrum of what, well, how the, you know, obviously the Jewish people, it was their book before it was ours. They had the book of Genesis or reading it long before us Christians came along. So how did they think about it? How did they understand it before the full revelation of Christ and Pentecost and the apostles began to teach it then in light of the fulfillment of what we hear in Genesis, the fulfillment in Christ, how then the early Christians interpret it. So when you do that, it makes it for a, very, a potpourri of really exciting reading. But do these Jewish commentaries pick up things that, 
escape the notice of Christian commentators? I think so, um, because, for example, Sarna, I would have quoted him a lot more than I did, uh, but you're limited as to how many quotes you can use before you have to pay royalties and rights to use their quotes and things. Um, but Nahum Sarna has a way with words. I mean, he's brilliant. He's a wordsmith. And he understands the Jewish language like others don't. I mean, you can have, say, a Catholic scholar who understands Hebrew and he reads it in Hebrew. But when you have a man like Sarna, he also has immersed himself in all of the ancient literature of the cultures around. So he is writing not only as English as his language, Hebrew as his language, but he's also writing, understanding the languages and the literature of the cultures around him. And he also understands the nuances, the theological nuances of the Hebrew words. So I found him my very favorite author as I was studying this. And if he was alive, I would have flown out to meet him and thank him for what he did because I found his book, and it's entitled, by the way, the JPS, uh, Jewish Publishing Society's Torah Commentary on Genesis. I have that whole series, by the way. They also have Exodus and Leviticus. But his book, I really enjoyed because of his understanding of the language, his nuances of the of the language and the meaning, and brought out insights that I couldn't find anywhere else. With that, we've already covered the first book in your list. Next is the commentary of another Jewish scholar, Michael Karasik. What do you admire in it? What I liked about his is that he goes back, he's not so much giving his own opinion, but going back to ancient Jewish writers and the writers of the Middle Ages. And he's, so So as I'm going along in my book, say, for example, I want to get a little more, what did the Jewish uh, thinkers, rabbis, how did they understand Abraham offering his son Isaac? So I would go to this set, and I have, I actually, it's called Genesis, an introduction and commentary, and I have that digitally, but it's, it also they have all of the books of the Old Testament, in it, which they would call the Tanakh. Of course, they wouldn't call it the Old Testament because they don't accept the New Testament. But in his, he's bringing out a, a, not just like Sarna is the him, his kind of his commentary, but but this one is uh, Karasek. He's bringing out the ancient writers, the medieval writers, so you can get an idea and a flavor for the wide expanse of Jewish thought on a certain passage. And, and you know, some of these middle mid eastern middle um middle ages, like like this book on Rambon, for example. And he, he's from if I remember right, like twelve hundred. And to to read their thoughts on the biblical passages was really fascinating. And and that way I can elicit not only the Old Testament thoughts on Abraham, for example, and the pre-Christ, some that were written, like the Book of Jubilees in first century. But these guys, this one really centers in on maybe the Middle Ages and gives a flavor so you can get the, because there's a progression of thought um, on, on how things are translated. And I, I just found it fascinating. And I I drew from these guys, not, I didn't use everything they said, but just some of the real nuggets and put them in my book for people to enjoy. Thank you for listening. To read or listen to the rest of this interview and gain full access to our archive, visit 5booksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and give it a top rating on the platform of your choice. That way more people can discover it. You can also support the podcast and help us produce more interviews like this one by making a one-off donation via the link given in the show notes. As little as one dollar, one pound or one euro can help and will be greatly appreciated. Thank you once again and God bless.